أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الأرجاس وطهرهم من الأدناس وجعل مودتهم أجرا على الناس ولا سيما على بقية الله في الأرضين الإمام المنتظر صاحب الزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ابن هدات المهديين وعلى صحبهم الأخيار المنتجبين وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والشهداء والمجاهدين في سبيل الله منذ آدم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا الموؤودة سئلت بأي ذنب قتلت صلوات على محمد وآل محمد Since we've gathered this evening to commemorate the martyrdom but before that also the suffering and oppression that was experienced by Sayyida Fatima sallallahu alayha about the status of this woman quickly before we delve into tonight's topic from our Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam we have a hadith about how Allah looked at this woman not how we recognize her only and it's a narration which is often repeated لِفَاطِمَ سَلَامُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهَا تِسْعَ أَسْمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ She had nine names in front of Allah. Fatima, وَالصِدِّيقَ وَالْمُبَارَكَ وَالطَّاهِرَ And the Imam went on to mention all of these names and he finished with وَالزَّهْرَاء was one of her titles. In another narration from the same Imam, uh, peace be upon him, we have uh, from عن ابن عمارة عن أبيه from his father asking the Imam عليه السلام سألت أبا عبد الله عليه السلام عن فاطمة لما سميت الزهراء why was she called الزهراء what was the meaning behind this title he replied قال عليه السلام لأنها كانت إذا قامت في محرابها زهر نورها لأهل السماء when she stood in her place of prayer her luminosity and her light shone to the inhabitants of the heaven, كَمَا يَزْهَرُ نُورُ الْكَوَاكِبْ لِأَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ As the stars shine to the inhabitants of the earth. So her status was known much after the Prophet's time. What about during the Prophet's time and during his life? How much had he said about her? We have a narration again from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Mentioning very explicitly her status. And this is just one of many narrations that we have. It's not an isolated narration by any means. Fatima. As for my daughter Fatima, فَإِنَّهَا She is the leader of all the women of the world from the beginning and to the end. مني, and she is a part of myself. She is the light of my eyes. وَهِيَ ثَمَرَةُ فُؤَادِي She is the fruit of my heart. وَهِيَ رُوحِ الَّتِي بَيْنَ جَنْبَي She is the spirit which lies within me. وَهِيَ الْحَوْرَاءَ الْإِنْسِيَّةِ She is that heavenly creature which is like as a human being. She is that very angelic being. And so on and so forth. So we have these narrations. So even during the Prophet's life, the status of this woman was very well known and articulated. And that's why it's quite bewildering and puzzling therefore that despite her status being very well expressed explicitly by the Holy Prophet during his life, that immediately after his passing away, she should undergo the immensity and intensity of the suffering that she was exposed to. The question I want to ask here at the beginning, the answer could be yes or no. Just posing the question and we'll see more into it why this question has been asked. Would it have been socially acceptable or allowable for the heir of the Prophet, the only sole uh, person as far as the direct progeny of the Prophet was concerned, to be oppressed and suppressed to this intensity, to this extent, 
Had that person been a son and not a daughter? Not trying to say even for a minute that her femininity was the only reason she was oppressed. We all know there were political factors surrounding this. But would she have faced the amount of oppression she faced had that been a man in her place? And what kind of oppression was this? To what extent? We have from the hadith that when her rights were taken away and her property confiscated, she expressed in front of, in the court, Ihan Bani Qila. How shameful or shame on Bani Qila were well, then the sons of Medina or the surrounding vicinity. Will I be oppressed in regards to the heritage of my father? This is a very eloquent on one hand, yes, but very sharp way of, of rebuking someone in Arabic. Even if we refer to the classical Arabic and the, the lexicons like Lisan al-Arab, for example, can have several connotations. None of them are positive. E can mean to tell someone to be quiet very in a very sharp manner. Uskut, like E. E can be used to drive someone away. You don't want them to be there. You tell them to go away. E. E is also expressed as an as a expression of disgust and disappointment, immense disappointment. She is telling the people, E han bani qila. In this way, she's rebuking them. But the second part of the narration is also very interesting. Will I be oppressed in this way and the heritage of my father taken away and confiscated whilst you are within your eyesight, I'm in full view of everyone and you can hear everything which is going on meaning that what happened here was not something that happened between two or three people behind the closed doors of a court, no. Her oppression and the confiscation of her rights was a very public affair. She said, in front of all of your eyes, this is happening. And this narration goes on, if we refer to it afterwards, that you are people who have been known for your bravery and, and you're doing nothing, etc., etc. So, it was a very public affair. So, yes, there were political factors which played into this. But would it have been as easy to oppress a person had this person not been a female, had been a male? Remember, this was a time where just one generation ago, People were burying their daughters alive. It's unimaginable the heinousness of this kind of crime. But Allah mentions in the Quran that that Mauda will be asked for what, re what reason she was killed. People actually used to do this. Bury so women were worth nothing. It was uh, socially acceptable to oppress women. For a man to use up a woman's rights was nothing new. Even after, remember this is just one generation after daughters being buried alive. So on that note, with that opening, it would be quite ironic for us if we claim to claim her love and one of the factors which was a factor of the intensity of her oppression, we don't address it within ourselves and ask ourselves these questions. So when discussing these personalities, the women of Islam, often it comes down to, look, these are the women of Islam, Fatima alayha salam, Zainab salam alayha alayha, now gives us an opportunity to see how women should be, the ideal woman should be this way. How a woman should behave. No, let's look at what a woman's status is in Islam culturally and Islamically. Using tonight's night and the oppression of this holy woman. Islam is seen and portrayed in the society as a very misogynistic, anti-woman, suppressing women. In fact, if we look at Muslim countries, and I use the term Muslim very loosely, but countries which have known to have Muslim population primarily, they are seen to be these countries where women are oppressed, suppressed, have a lack of rights. Saudi Arabia, for example, some of you will remember that a few years back, the first woman pilot got her license to, to be able to fly a commercial airline. Hanadi Zakaria Al-Hindi, who a Meccan-born lady in the holy city of Mecca. She was born there. She was the first Saudi woman to get a license to be a pilot of a commercial airline. She could fly 200 or so passengers in a Boeing 747 now. Ironically, she had to be chauffeured to the airport in the plane because she was not allowed to drive a car. So we see in these countries, this is the kind of uh, oppression and suppression women undergo. Look at Saudi Arabia. So let's look closer to home, those of us who claim to be the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim wasalam. And let's ask the question, 
in Islam, is there something intrinsically, essentially something about Islam that makes it misogynistic, that makes it such that it is a religion that oppresses women? Is there something about the religion of Islam which is as such? We can say no, of course, and yes. No, if we look at the pure teachings of Islam with the attitude of the Prophet وسلم, and his holy progeny, then obviously no. However, if we look at Islamic heritage, then maybe yes. Meaning what? Islam, Islamic heritage, has come to us with a culture. We have inherited the Islamic religion. With it, we inherited the Islamic culture. Islamic culture. Meaning what? You know, we always say or we hear often that, you know, this practice is like this, this practice is like this. We should separate culture from religion. This is cultural, this is religious. This has nothing to do with religion, this is just cultural. We should separate the two. In fact, culture can never be fully separated from religion. Religion cannot exist fully without culture. Religious practices are embedded within culture, within a culture. So religion cannot be practiced with in a wholesome manner, and not just Islam, any religion, without it being embedded within a social context, within a culture. This, these rugs we're sitting on, for example, these red rugs. Why is it that often in Islamic centers we find rugs of this fashion? Where in the Quran or the Hadith is there a Hadith that in your Islamic centers you should have a rug or in the Quran, you know, the rugs of this Persian origin? We don't. Yet, when I enter a hall and there's these kind of rugs there, suddenly I feel like praying a two rakat prayer because it's more, it's Islamic here. I feel holy here. I'm suddenly overcome with the spiritual upliftment because of these rugs. What? It's got nothing to know. There's nothing wrong with it. But there's nothing religious about it. We've inherited this and we expect to find these here. Maybe rug or the, the carpet is a bit subjective. Certainly the dome and the minaret have become symbols of Islam. Here. A much more universal symbol of Islam. That wherever we go in the world, we look at a mosque, it has a dome on top and a towering minaret. The Prophet's mosque, when he built it, had what color dome on it? Had no roof, let alone a dome. The roof was the date palm leaves. In fact, to that extent, that if we look at the jurisprudence which came much later, then uh, Najmuddin al-Hilli, more commonly known as al-Muhaqqiq al-Hilli, the uncle and teacher of the famous al-Alam al-Hilli in the 13th century. Very big Shia mujtahid. In his book, uh, Al-Mukhtasar al-Nafi' which is still studied in the Islamic seminaries more in terms of its methodology, and language as opposed to being uh, authority in jurisprudence. But even in that book, when describing, this is much after the time of the Prophet, obviously, 13th century scholar, when describing the istihbab of a mosque, how a mosque should be, he says, uh, preferably it should be without a roof. Because the Prophet's mosque was without a roof. Or if it should have a roof, it should be the date palm leaves. And the minaret, what's a miner minaret? If the, the walls are like this, surrounding the mosque, the minaret should be a platform only, no higher than the wall of the mosque. No higher, on the same level, just a platform on the side, where the mu'adhin would stand and call to prayer. So these huge towering minarets we have are symbols of Islam. No, they're symbols of a culture. Now that culture has gained religiosity, just like these carpets. But there's nothing essentially about a dome and a minaret which makes it Islamic. Or the Ashura rituals, for example, the Pakistani community will have the rites and rituals of that holy time in their way. The Khoja community in their way, Iraqi communities in their way, Iranian in their way, Lebanese in their way. And everyone practices in their own fashion. Ask them whilst they're beating their chests or their thighs or whatever they're undertaking, that is this a cultural practice or a religious? This is a religious practice. Yes, it's a religious practice. But it's been clothed with their culture. Religion cannot exist fully, cannot be practiced fully, without being embedded in some culture. Now having understood that, when Islam came 
1400 years ago and the Prophet re received revelation and he introduced Islam to the people, it came within a culture. That culture was heavily misogynistic. That culture was heavily male chauvinistic, heavily anti-women. And we inherited that Islam, that religion, but with it we inherited parts of the culture. Remember that culture we said women were, or girls rather, were buried alive on their birth just before the Prophet came. That same generation. So camels and goats and sheep would not be buried alive because they're valuable. For business, you, you can eat them or you travel with them, they carry the goods. But girls would be buried alive. So the girl or the female had less worth than cattle. That, that's the context we're talking about. Islam came then. And we've inherited that religion. Man at that time would inherit the wives of his father. Imagine. When the father passes away, the wives he leaves behind, the son would inherit the wives. Women had no value. As if they could be bought and sold, inherited, given away. We inherited that culture, what does it imply? As far as the Qur'an is concerned, obviously, ideologically speaking, the Qur'an was not and does not become adulterated or changed. Fine, accepted. The hadith corpus we have, however, is not immune to error. We find in the hadith sometimes, yes, the person, the narrator could have narrated what the imam or the prophet said word by word. This is exactly the words that the prophet spoke. But we can't be sure of that, obviously, 1400 years ago. It could have been narrated in terms of the meaning. This is what the imam meant and paraphrased to the next person. The next person, this is 1400 years of chains we're talking about. So the hadith, as far as it was concerned, is reliant upon the narrator's their interpretation of what's being said, their memories, and if it's on their interpretation, the flavor of their background is put into it before they pass it to the next person, often. The environment was one where women had no social role, so by and large, the narrators of a hadith are all men, with exceptions, but they're all men, so everything comes down from that male-dominated society. Hence, the laws of Islam that we see today Marriage, divorce, custody, the civil laws are heavily skewed towards the man. Now our jurists are starting to relook at some of the things, reinterpret some things. So if we look at the contemporary Marja in his own right, Ayatollah Yusuf Sani, for example, in Iran, when Ziba Mir Husseini interviewed him and she's transcripted or transcribed this interview in her book. Islam and gender. She talks about her Ayat Lasani in his opinion, which is outlandish, which is breaking the status quo completely. Doesn't make sense. A woman can initiate divorce. And yeah, yeah, we have that in Islam jurisprudence. The man can just say, I divorce you and it's all over. The woman has to go, she's undergoing some oppression or this or that. She can go to Hakim Shari. And he investigates and he sees whether or not it's viable. No, Ayat Lasani says no. If she sees that her intellectual capacity or socially she is being hindered, she can walk out of the marriage and go back to her parents' place. No hakim shari, nothing. The laws are being relooked at now. In the, as far as even leadership is concerned, in the history of Islam, we have no women leaders. Imagine an imam making a woman a governoress of ex or a representative of, of himself. It never happened. The social context did not allow it, actually. Imagine Imam X would make his representative a woman in a certain area, in a, a, a time frame where women have less position than a camel or cattle. Who would listen to her? It was not possible to do this. The context did not allow it. Does that mean now we have some jurisprudential precedent set that women cannot be leaders? The context of that time did not allow it, the social context. So now, in 1400 years later, and in a different geographical setting altogether, thousands of miles away from Arabia, we inherited the religion, we inherited the culture, we inherited the hadith corpus, which could have been flavored in whichever way. And now, if a woman comes to the fore to become a leader, suddenly it's possible her hijab would be compromised if she becomes, or if she speaks publicly, 
Her hijab could be called into question. Really. So when our lady Fatima Salamullahi Alayha went to the court to ask for her rights, she brought her hijab into question? No. Yes, but you see, she came out only when it was necessary. So only when it was necessary, she called her hijab into question? No. Yes, she lived much of her life indoors, agreed, as far as the, hadith, the history is concerned. Does that set a precedence for us that we cannot act in a different way in another social setting, in another cultural environment? Often we are not mature enough as a society to accept that change. Suddenly we think of women as hijab. And if she comes to the forefront, her hijab is brought into question. A man doesn't have that problem. You may have heard of the, of the story of the student and the teacher. Both were walking through the forest and they came by a river. When they came by a river, they heard a woman shouting and screaming for help. She was drowning in the river. She couldn't swim, she was suffering. The student didn't know what to do. Should I go, should I stay, how do I help her? Should we find a bark or a stick to try and pull her from the water? The teacher jumped into the river, picked up the woman with both hands, brought her onto the bank, and carried on walking. And the student followed him. And they're continuing their walk through the forest. The student is really uneasy about what just happened. One hour, they're still walking, hiking through the forest. Two hours, then the student can't take it anymore. He asks his teacher, I have to ask you something before we proceed. He said, what? what's the question? How did you just pick that woman up with your bare hands, who was not your mahram, and put her on the riverbank and just carried on walking? He said, her life was in danger. She was about to die. He saved her life. I picked her up and I put her down on the bank. You're still carrying her. Often our mindset is like this. When it comes to women, suddenly it's about hijab and uh, everything is taken within a, a sexualized context that we can't think of women this way, we can't look at them this way. We don't think of them as human beings actually. And this is what we've inherited. Sorry, I'm not sure how to... Uh... Oh, there we go. Okay. Forget leadership. Forget publicly speaking. Becoming a marja. When Ayatollah Ishaq Fayyad was here in London recently, he was quoted to have said that there is no legal or jurisprudential restriction on a woman becoming a marja. That was just quoted. We don't have anything written from him. We have from Ayatollah Muhammad Ibrahim Jannati, not to be confused with the Ayatollah Jannati who is politically involved in Iran. Ayatollah Muhammad Ibrahim Jannati says on his website and on that reference you can check it. La tushtarat fil ijtihad ar-rujula. As far as istihad is concerned, rujula, masculinity, is not a stipulation. And that translation underneath, you can see, is not something that I translated. It's something on the English part of his website. Because he specifies there, it is not necessary that a mujtahid, not just a mujtahid, yeah, a woman can become mujtahida. No. But a mujtahid, who is followed for taqlid. So people follow her, becoming a marja. Men follow her. There is no legal stipulation that they should be a man. Yes, in today's, unfortunately, we don't have the infrastructure within the Islamic seminaries to educate women to that extent that the men have and reach that level of ijtihad easily. Although we have had some uh, mujtahidat, women becoming mujtahids, in the, but few and far between. Certainly no maraja. But as far as legally is concerned, there is no impediment on man doing taqlid of a woman mujtahida. So what with public speaking or with coming to the forefront to do X, Y, Z? This stay-at-home attitude, it was there in the Indian subcontinent. It was certainly there in Arabia. And we came with it. But if we look at Islam and how women have been portrayed, certainly Bilqis in the Quran did not have a stay-at-home attitude. And she is looked at on meritoriously in the Quran. She was a queen. When Sulaiman sent her the invitation to Islam, she consulted her viziers, her mala. And uh, but she, they, what did they say? Al amru laki. This is what we advise. The decision is yours. You're the queen. The Quran did not say, "Oh well, she should have stayed at home. She shouldn't have become the queen, and she can't take decisions." Khadija, salamullahi alayha, one of the women of paradise, was not a stay-at-home woman. 
She was the richest woman, one of the richest entrepreneurs in that environment, which is rare in that social context to reach that level. But exception to the rule, she became that. So when we talk about patriarchy or male dominance, remember, patriarchy, the word itself, has two connotations, negative and positive. Negative, that the man should dominate everything. Men should be in authority always. Women have no choice, no rule, no nothing. That's negative. Patriarchy, that man has some sort of authority, has another connotation which is positive. That man, being sometimes in that position of authority, as we know the, the quotation, with great power comes great responsibility. I'm quoting that, it's probably, I think, Spider-Man's uncle or someone who said that in one of the movies. But anyway, with great power comes great responsibility. With patriarchy comes great responsibility. And patriarch, that patriarchal nature that Islam has taught us, or the Islamic heritage we've inherited, there's a positive side to it. It means that man also has a responsibility of care. A responsibility of affection towards those who are dependent upon him. And that's why we have the hadith. For example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlikum. The best, the be, li ahlihi rather, the best of you is the one who is best towards his family. Or ahl also means in Arabic wife. Best towards his wife. Wa ana khayrukum li ahli. I'm better than all of you as far as how I treat my own family. Beyond that, ma akrama nisa illa karimun. No one is going to ennoble or dignify women except the one who himself is noble or kareem. And the one who degrades them and puts them down. Wa ma ahana hunna illa laim. And no one can degrade them, no one would degrade them except the one who himself is wretched. So if we look at the purity of Islam and the patriarchal culture that we can inherit from it, there is a positive side to it, yes. Islam and its purity has this teaching. Or beyond this, another narration which is not quoted uh, in a plethora of our corpuses, but we have it and I found it in, in one of the collections of our hadith, which if we look at it and then we mirror our own societies according to it, it might make us blush because it's alien to us. From Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Inna rajula la yu'jar. Indeed, a man would be rewarded. For what? Fi raf'il luqma. To lift the morsel of food. Ila fim ra'atih. To the mouth of his wife. To treat a woman or a wife in that way for us is something alien. But the Prophet says no. A man will be rewarded for this. Yes, Islam teaches us that patriarchal culture that came with it, but there's a positive side to it. Now, a kind of lengthy narration which we'll go quick, through quickly, but it's beautiful and it's encouraging for us. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam narrated from him. That he said to his brother, his cousin, his son-in-law, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he said to him, قال, Ya Abel Hassan, Oh, father of Hassan, he called him with his kunya. And as we would imagine, our master replied, if with full obedience to the Holy Prophet, and the Imam is saying himself, قلت لبيك يا رسول الله. He said, yes, I'm here, O oh, messenger of Allah. What the Prophet said next, he made Imam Ali alayhi salam listen carefully. اسمع مني وما أقول إلا من أمر ربي. Listen to what I'm saying now. So now, what the Prophet is about to say is not ordinary conversation. Something momentous. Listen to what I'm about to say because I don't speak except by the command of my Lord. So something which is coming now is momentous what he's saying now. He continued. Ma min rajulin yu'inum ra'atahu. There is no man who helps or aids his wife fi baytiha in the home. إِلَّا كَانَ لَهُ بِكُلِّ شَعْرَةٍ عَلَىٰ بَدَنِهِ عِبَادَةٍ سَنَةٍ Except that he would have for every hair on his, not just his head, every hair on his body, the reward of a year's worship. صِيَامُ نِهَارِهَا وَقِيَامُ لَيْلِهَا Whilst fasting, 
in the day times and standing for prayer in the night times. Whoever helps his wife in the house. And beyond this, the Prophet continued, وَأَعْطَاهُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الثَّوَابِ مِثْلَ مَا أَعْطَاهُ الصَّابِرِينَ He, Allah, would grant him from reward what he granted the perseverant ones who, Dawood and Nabi, the Prophet David. وَيَعْقُوبُ وَعِيسَى عَلَيْهُمُ السَّلَامُ And all these Prophets, what they were granted in reward, Allah would grant him this. Beyond this, he continued, Ya Ali, مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْخِدْمَةِ الْعِيَالِ فِي الْبَيْتِ وَلَمْ يَأْنَفْ The one who helps his family in the house and is not arrogant in doing so. وَلَمْ يَأْنَفْ So there's a stipulation here, a condition here. وَلَمْ يَأْنَفْ كَتَبَ اللَّهُ اسْمَهُ فِي دِيوَانِ الشُّهَدَاء Allah puts his name in the records of the martyrs. Beyond this, وَكَتَبَ لَهُ بِكُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةِ ثَوَابْ أَلْفْ شَهِيدٍ وَكَتَبَ لَهُ بِكُلِّ قَدَمٍ ثَوَابْ حَجُّ وَعُمْرَةِ Allah writes for him, for every uh, night and day, the reward of, not a martyr, a thousand martyrs. And for every step taken, the reward of performing hajj and umrah. Beyond this, وَأَعْطَاهُ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ عَرَقٍ فِي جَسَدِهِ مَدِينَةً فِي الْجَنَّةِ Allah grants him for every drop of sweat on his body, an entire city in paradise. Beyond this, Ya Ali, the Prophet is saying to his brother, Ya Ali, Sa'atun fi khidmatil bayt khayrun min ibadat alf sana wa alf hijja wa alf umrah. Uh, remember, Sa'a now is translated into the modern day Arabic as an hour. Sa'a, at that time there was no conception of 60 minutes becoming an hour. Sa'a meant a moment or an instance or a duration of helping or serving in the house, or not helping, serving in the house. Khidmat al bayt is better than the worship of a thousand years and a thousand hajj and a thousand umrah. Beyond this, وَخَيْرٌ مِّنْ عِتْقِ أَلْفْ رَقَبَةً Better for that person than freeing a thousand slaves. وَأَلْفْ غَزْوَةً Taking part in a thousand battles of Islam. وَأَلْفْ مَرِيدٍ عَادَةً Visiting a thousand sick people. وَأَلْفْ جُمْعَةً وَأَلْفْ جَنَازَةً A thousand Fridays and taking part in a thousand funeral rites. وَأَلْفْ جَاعِئْ يُشْبِعُهُمْ Feeding a thousand Hungry people. وَأَلْفْ عَارٍ يَكْسُوهُمْ Clothing a thousand unclothed people. وَخَيْرٌ لَهُ مِنْ أَلْفْ دِينَارٍ يَتَصَدَّقَ بِهَا عَلَى الْمَسَاكِينَ And better than giving all those, well you can read it for yourself, all those dinars to the poor people. Beyond this. وَخَيْرٌ لَهُ مِنْ أَنْ يَقْرَأَ التَّوْرَاتَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ وَالزَّبُورِ وَالْفُرْقَانِ Better that for that person then to read the Torah and the Injil and the Psalms and the Quran for an hour's housework. I'm almost starting to wish I hadn't brought my family to this lecture with me. But the Prophet carries on. Ya Ali, man lam yatnaf min khidmati al Whoever is not arrogant in helping with the family, with the household. Fahuwa kafaratun lil kabair. It is an absolving of not sins, kabair for major sins. وَيُطْفِئُ غَضْبَ الرَّبْ It extinguishes the wrath of Allah, the wrath of the Lord. يَا عَلِي لَا يَخْدِمُ الْعِيَالِ إِلَّا صِدِّيقٌ O Ali, no one would help the family except the righteous person. O Shaheed, or the one who had the rank of a martyr. O Rajul, يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ بِهِ خَيْرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Or that kind of person for whom Allah wishes the best in the world and the hereafter. Patriarchy we have inherited from Islam, its negative aspects and its positive aspects. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the night we've gathered to commemorate that holy lady that we decipher between the two. Yes, our, our Islam will not exist without our culture. But we are able to sift between the two and take the positives and relinquish the negatives. So these days when we gather to remember this woman, it is that woman who... Our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam was overheard by Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. 
He said, Sami'atu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam yaqulu li Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam qabla mawtihi bi thalath. That I heard the Holy Prophet say this to Ali three days before his passing away. Salamun alayka ya abar rayhanatayn. Peace be upon you, O father of the two flowers, Imam Hassan Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Usika bi rayhanatayya min ad dunya. I am advising you to look after these two flowers of mine in this world. Why? فَعَنْ قَلِيلٍ يَنْهَدُ رُكْنَاكَ Shortly, rukn means that cornerstone, your support. Your two cornerstones will be lifted away from you. And the history narrates when Rasulullah passed away, Imam Ali al Islam was, said, this was the first rukn that the Prophet had told me about is taken away from me. And when his wife Fatima alayhi salam passed away, he said, this was the second rukn that the Prophet had told me about. Before the Prophet passed away, he was seen to cry. They asked him, why are you crying? You're surely not afraid of death. The Prophet said, no. I'm crying over my progeny. What the evil ones from my ummah will do to my progeny after me. As if I see my daughter Fatima in front of me. وَقَدْ ظُلِمَتْ بَعْدِي She is being oppressed after me. وَهِيَ تُنَادِي يَا أَبَتَا يَا أَبَتَا She is crying out, O oh my father, O oh my father, فَلَا يُعِينُهَا أَحَدٌ مِّنْ أُمَّتِي Not a single person from my ummah will come to her aid. It is also narrated about her holy life after the passing away of the Prophet. وَرُوِيَ أَنَّهَا مَا زَالَتْ بَعْدَ أَبِيهَا مُعَصَّبَةَ الرَّأَسِ After the passing of the Prophet, she was in such a state that she was never seen, but that her head was wrapped and tied up because she, of migraines. نَاحِلَةَ الْجِسْمِ Her body was weak and thin. Imagine she was not an old woman. She was a very young woman. To be in this state, what she must have undergone. And when the news was brought to him, Imam Ali alayhi salam, about the passing away of his wife, the history narrates, we find in Bihar definitely. Who, who was this person? He was the lion of Islam, the hand of Allah in the battlefield, the bravest of the brave, the champion of Badr and Khandaq and Khaybar. This momentous giant of the battlefield, when the news was brought to him that she has finally passed away, History says, فَوَقَعَ عَلِيٌّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِهِ That Amir al-Mu'minin fell flat on his face. And he was reported to have said, بِمَنِ الْعَزَىٰ يَا بِنْتَ مُحَمَّدٍ Who shall I turn to for consolation now, O daughter of Muhammad? كُنْتُ بِكِ أَتَعَزَىٰ فَفِي مَا الْعَزَىٰ بَعْدَكِ I used to turn to you. For consolation, when the Prophet passed away, you are, who now, who do I turn to after you? And Nahju Balagha say, quotes Imam Ali alayhi salam as how he talks about his situation afterwards. Now as for my grief, it is perpetual. As for my nights now, they are spent in sleeplessness. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the status of this holy lady that we rectify our own selves in all the regards we've spoken about today within and inshallah rectify whatever may need to be rectified in our families, communities and societies at large. Wa akhru da'awana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. We have five minutes for question and answers. Start with the lady's side, if there are any. Sheikh, thank you so much for a very enlightening uh, lecture. And certainly some of the hadith I hadn't heard, particularly the last one. May I just ask uh, about uh, its authenticity? If somebody challenges me about its authenticity, what should be my reply? Which one? Which particular hadith? The long one. The long one. Uh, that hadith actually was said on two different occasions. 
And so we have it narrated on two occasions and in various books of hadith. The hadith that we mentioned before, before that, in the in the rajul la yu'jar, that a man would be rewarded fi raf'il luqmati ila fi mra'ati, to lift the morsel of food to. That one certainly is not often reported, but we have it reported in, uh, for example, Muhajjit al Bayda um, is certainly quoted in that. As for that one, the second one, the longer one, it is far more uh, oft reported. So if that's one benchmark by which to judge its authenticity, it is narrated often. It's not something we find in, in a footnote of some book. But if you want, I have your email address, of course, so I can send you the reference for it and maybe some more details on where and how often and how frequently it can be found. Inshallah. Just a full-on question. Is there a reciprocal hadith for women's right on men as long as, as that as well? I was afraid you would ask that question, actually. <laughs> no, we have um, many a hadith uh, with regards to the rewards that a woman would also receive in her kindness to her husband and her approaching her husband and her even serving a glass of water to her husband. We have all of these. But I was afraid that in previous lectures they've been over-represented <laughs> in, in our culture, so I decided to take something which has been under-researched or under-represented. But yes, we do have reciprocal and mutual ahadith. Any from the sister's side? Oh, brothers? Thank you very much, Wanda.